All right. Well, let's get started. We'll, we'll let everyone else trickle in. Um, I am super excited to be here tonight. My name is Dr. Jennifer Stewart. I will be your host and moderator tonight, and this is going to be a fantastic webinar. We are so excited. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, Dr. Quint, who if you haven't had the pleasure of hearing her speak, you are in for a real treat tonight. I am really, really excited. So Dr. Quint is a Texas native, which I didn't know, uh, and graduated from Baylor University with a Bachelor in Arts degree in biology. She completed her MBA and MS in biology at the West Texas A&M University. She received her Doctorate of Optometry degree from Indiana University. After graduation, she completed a postdoctoral residency, residency in ocular disease, with an emphasis on ocular emergency and trauma at the Illinois Eye Institute in Chicago. She's an active volunteer, presenter, author in many industry publications, which I'm sure you've read. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a board certified diplomat of the American Board of Optometry. She serves on the Executive Meetings Committee for the American Optometric Association and is the Vice President of the Maine Optometric Association. Dr. Quint co-owns Smart Eye Care, a multi-location private practice in Maine. Thanks, Jen. You're That's very, welcome. very nice. <laughs> it's an honor to be here with you. I do have a couple of financial disclosures, but all of those have been mitigated. And let's jump in. Dry eye is one of my absolute passions. Um, like Jen said, I co-own Smart Eye Care, and two years ago, we opened a separate location that houses a dry eye and aesthetic center, and so I've had a lot of experience, and I love educating and connecting with you guys to learn how we can best treat our patients when it comes to treating dry eye. So dry eye has evolved a lot over the last several years, especially over the last decade. And so hopefully at the end of this lecture, you'll come away with a more modern approach so that you can have some clinical pearls to best serve your patients. So let's jump in. So dry eye, we know it is so common. I almost feel like everybody has dry eye until proven otherwise. Currently there's 30 million Americans that suffer from this very common eye condition. Uh, annually, it's approximately $3.8 billion are spent on dry eye symptom relief. So this tells us that patients, whether or not they admit it in our clinical chairs, are seeking some sort of over-the-counter treatment to relieve their symptoms. Dry eye is actually one of the most common uh, encounter diseases that you're going to see, depending on your mode of practice, of course, but it's very common. And so it's super important that we as eye care providers get really comfortable with understanding this, knowing how to diagnose it, being able to offer very modern, different treatment approach approaches so that our patients can have the best care. What's also interesting is that 43% of asymptomatic patients do have clinical dry eye. And so that means that sometimes it almost is maybe a little bit of convincing to our patients, a lot of patient education, so that we can help our patients have the tools that they need in order to keep their eyes healthy in many years to come. Dry eye has had a lot of different nomenclature over the last several decades. Sometimes you'll see it in the literature as dry eye syndrome, dry eye disease, you know, ocular surface disease, ocular surface inflammation. And so hopefully as more things come about with the dry eye category, we'll have a little more streamlined nomenclature, but I think just having an awareness of the different names and then just being consistent with that name and that terminology within your own clinical practice setting is, is really the most important. If we look back to DOES 2, they gave us an awesome definition of dry eye. We know that it's multifactorial. It's a disease that affects the ocular surface and it's characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film, which includes tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation, and neurosensory abnormalities. And so when I'm thinking and looking at you know, my dry eye patients, I'm thinking about all these different little kind of sub bullet points of this definition to make sure that I'm not missing anything and to make sure that when I'm developing kind of a treatment plan that's individualized for each patient, I'm also kind of going through that bullet list and making sure that I'm not just focusing on one of these categories. This is also, you know, this definition, you'll also see all these new developments that we have to with the different technology that's coming about for different treatment options kind of goes back to this choose do's definition of dry eye. 
So this presentation is called a modern approach. And so I guess I would say the non-modern approach historically has been to almost just treat the symptoms, right? We've done this through artificial tears, punctal plugs, anti-inflammatory drops, or sometimes we've just ignored this because we didn't have a lot of treatment options. And even though, you know, a lot of these things on the slide here are still applicable and used in today's um, modality for this dry eye treatment, it's also important to combine this with some other things and to under, understand more about how this disease process, our understanding of it has evolved so that you can take a very modern approach. So if I had to kind of categorize that, what's a modern approach to dry eye? Well, I would say it starts with identifying the underlying cause. Instead of just putting a Band-Aid on it, instead of just ignoring it, throwing some tears at it and moving along, taking the time to dive in and figure out what's causing that disease in the first place and then addressing it. And then setting realistic expectations with our patients that dry eye, ocular surface disease is a chronic condition. It's going to involve some level of maintenance. There's no one and done or some overnight magical cure. And so a modern approach is having that conversation, that patient education with our patients, that realistically, in order for us to maintain this disease process, there's going to be some level of maintenance with involved. I hope at the end of this presentation that all of you will be a better clinician rather than just throwing some artificial tears whenever you have a patient that you clinically see signs of symptoms, you know, of dry eye or your patients have symptoms. Artificial tears are helpful in dry eye treatment, but they often, they don't address the underlying cause. They often just put a Band-Aid on it. And so let's not be lazy as clinicians, right? So let's not, when we have that patient, don't just throw tears and that alone at it. Dive a little bit deeper so that you can make sure that you're delivering, you know, the best care to the patient possible. So let's go back to the basics a little bit and let's think about tear film, right? Part of that dues definition had to deal with tear film instability. And so when I graduated optometry school about a decade ago, I left, you know, optometry school thinking that the tear film had three distinct layers, lipid, aqueous, and mucin, which it still does. But I kind of left with the impression that they were very, very isolated. But what we know now is that we do kind of have this outer lipid layer, and that lipid layer does kind of protect and prevent the tears from evaporating in between blinks. But what we also know is that the aqueous and the mucin aren't two distinct layers. They're really kind of almost mixed in with one. And so it kind of makes this mucoaqueous layer. That aqueous portion does make, that watery portion makes up the bulk of the tear film, but it is often mixed in with this mucin. And that mucin is super important. Remember the mucin comes from the goblet cells and it helps spread the tears across the, sump, the surface of the eye. And so in order to have a healthy tear film, you have to have each of these three components. And if one of them is lacking, it throws, it throws everything off and it kind of dis, um, disrupts that equilibrium with, which is there, which often causes dry eye symptoms. We've often with dry eye thought about kind of the categories and, you know, we've thought of these two bucket, buckets where there's aqueous deficient, which is really where, you know, a patient just doesn't make enough tears. And then the other bucket of being evaporative dry eye, which is where they make enough tears, they're just maybe not of the best quality. And we've seen research over, you know, the last um, several decades that show that, you know, of these two buckets, Evaporative dry eye is definitely a lot more common. It makes up kind of the, the more um, majority of these dry eye patients. But as we've learned more about these disease processes, we're learning that a lot of times dry eye isn't as always easy, as simple as just aqueous or just evaporative. A lot of times there's a mix. And there's some research that shows that that mix is about 36%. Clinically, when I have, when I'm in our dry eye clinic and I'm seeing these patients, I personally feel like that mix is probably a little bit more. And so it's important to remember that because when you have all these really cool tools and you're treating a patient and maybe they see a little bit of improvement, 
but maybe they're not seeing dramatic improvement. You know, it's, it's, it could be a mixture. It's, it's not always just evaporative or just aqueous. Sometimes you have to hit both components in order to get the patient better, in order to get their tear film um, a lot more stable and to relieve some of their dry eye. So when we, when we, Going back to this evaporative, it does, you know, kind of affect the majority of this dry eye category. And historically, we've thought of just kind of this lipid layer, right? Like if the meibomian glands were clogged, then the lipid layer was disrupted. And so that's when the tears evaporate off. And that definitely is one component of it. But evaporative can also come from any layer of the tear film that's deficient. So whether it's the aqueous layer, the lipid layer, or the mucin layer, if there's any sort of deficiency that's there and that tear film is unstable, that's going to cause to some degree some level of an evaporative dry eye. When those tears are evaporating and the body can't make, you know, keep that balance of making up with those tears, that's going to cause stress. That stress is going to lead to tissue damage. That tissue damage is then going to lead to inflammation. The inflammation is going to kind of cycle back and cause more tissue damage. And then we kind of get in this, um, you know, dry eye circle um, as well. So we need to make sure when we're thinking about evaporative that it's not just the lipid layer. You have to look at the aqueous. You have to look at the, the mucin layer as well in order to make sure that you're improving kind of that whole evaporative state. Lifestyle and environmental factors can also contribute to this um, tear film eva you know, um, evaporation. We'll talk more about that. So looking at those categories, you know, dry eye is inflammation, but why is that inflammation occurring? You know, it's helpful to kind of back it up a few. So think about symptoms of dry eye, right? All of us probably know and our patients probably know that the first thing we think of with dry eye is often comfort issues. And sometimes with comfort issues, I feel like with my patients, especially if they're new to our practice or new to our clinic, you know, they'll have all the clinical signs of dry eye. And, and we're asking about, you know, do you, do you have any dry eye symptoms? And a lot of times they'll be like, nah, doc, it's just allergies, right? Like I don't have dry eye. I just have allergies. And sometimes it is allergies, but more often than not with my patients, I see that those kind of allergy symptoms are in fact dry eye symptoms. So it's helpful to not just take that at face value, you have to dive a little bit further, ask the right history questions with your patients. Comfort issues could be burning, watering, gritty, a form body sensation, redness, itching, and those symptoms can manifest differently for every patient. And so sometimes if you just ask about burning or just ask about, you know, a foreign body sensation, sometimes that's not enough. And a lot of our patients think that when they have watering of their tears, that there's no way their eyes could be dry. And so you have to take the time to explain to the patients why this is occurring. Also, don't forget that dry eye isn't just comfort issues, especially in a very early disease process. A lot of times it affects vision. I had a couple patients too today, actually, that came in to our practice, convinced that they just needed a glasses update and were there really to get their prescription tweaked. Come to find out that their prescription hadn't changed at all. Vision was just a little bit blurry because they had dry eye. And so making sure that you as a clinician are, you know, being mindful of that, educating our staff appropriately so that we can help kind of catch these patients earlier on, and then educating and explaining to our patients that dry eye isn't always comfort. Sometimes it's blurry vision, sometimes it's fluctuating vision. And then sometimes our patients are just asymptomatic. And so sometimes that can be frustrating as a clinician because clinically you'll see all this there, but sometimes if a patient doesn't feel it symptomatically, it can be hard to motivate them to get the care that they need in order to keep their eyes healthy. But a, you know, asymptomatic patients, this asymptomatic symptom could come because they've, you know, they have some corneal nerve damage and they're just not sensing things how they will. Sometimes if they're wearing a contact lens that can mask that the, a lot of those symptoms. And so, you know, asking the right question to kind of tease that out with patients is important. And sometimes too, if they've had dry eye for years and years and decade, that becomes their new normal. And so they may not realize that they're having these symptoms. And so I always tell patients that sometimes you might not realize that you have it until your eyes start to feel better. You forget how they're supposed to feel. So don't let the asymptomatic um, deter you from treating it. Sometimes it just creates a little more patient education on the back end of things. 
So let's talk about risk factors for dry eye. There's a lot of different risk factors, more than even water here, but the main ones typically fall into age. You know, historically we've thought of dry eye as kind of only affecting older patients, but we now know, especially with screen time, that dry eye is affecting uh, really young patients too. In fact, I have a handful of patients in our dry eye clinic that are around the age of six, yes, six, that have full-blown dry eye disease, ocular surface disease. So us as a clinician, we need to be careful that we're not kind of categorizing these patients and taking a step back and realizing that dry eye can affect all of our patients of all ages, older and younger. Other risk factors, you know, being uh, female is a little bit higher likelihood. Dry eye affects males and females, but for females, especially around kind of that menopausal hormonal time, symptoms and clinical signs usually kind of pop up. So just be really mindful of that. There's a lot of different medications that can contribute to dry eye disease, a patient's diet, the environment that they're in, their history of any ocular surgeries, their lifestyle factors you know, if they wear contact lenses, what systemic conditions that they have. So any of these risk factors, you know, if a patient has these, you should be kind of thinking when they're coming into your chair, looking at, um, looking at doing a really thorough exam to just make sure that they don't have dry eye. As far as systemic conditions, this isn't an all-inclusive list, but common ones that we see, hypertension, diabetes, rosacea, any sort of asthma, eczema, you know, those atopy conditions, um, anything hormonal related, lupus, Sjogren's, thyroid, uh, anything uh, autoimmune, and then sleep apnea is a big one. And so I've uh, trained my staff that if a patient has these conditions to really make sure that they're asking the right questions about dry eye to make sure that we're not missing anything clinically. As far as medications contributing to dry eye, there's a huge list. I copied and pasted one straight from, um, from a white paper, but common ones that I just generally kind of look out for, you know, anything that's allergy related, even if it's over the counter, if a patient's on birth control, if they're on any sort of psych med for like depression, anxiety, anything related to that. Uh, retinoids is another one that I definitely make sure that my staff is asking about and I ask about hypertension, cholesterol, um, diabetes, and asthma. And so what we do is um, in, my, in my clinic, if we have a patient that has one of those conditions or is on medication, something on this list here, we're automatically starting to ask those questions to kind of tease out some of those um, dry eye patients. And believe it or not, sometimes, you know, sometimes the patients are symptomatic, sometimes they're not. But um, it's amazing to me how easy it is almost to build a dry eye patient base just by having these normal patients in your chair and just asking the right questions and you know, then providing the proper diagnosis and the proper treatment for it. So let's talk about contact lenses. Patients who wear contact lenses are at a much higher risk of having dry eye disease. 60% of contact lens wearers do have this dry eye condition. And we know that just wearing contact lenses does tend to accelerate that dry eye disease process a little bit faster. It's super important to be mindful that contact lens wearers can often, um, they won't have symptoms of dry eye because the contacts can mask the symptoms. And so clinically, sometimes the patients you know, you'll ask, like, do you have any of these symptoms? And they'll say, no, my contacts, my eyes feel better actually when I have my contacts in. And so usually then I tease out, well, when you take your contact out, how do your eyes feel? Oh, they burn all the time, doc, or they're always red, or they always feel irritated. That's why I have to wear my contacts for 18 hours a day. So my eyes feel good. You know, that that's kind of a ding, 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 red flag, but we've got something kind of brewing beneath the surface there. A contact lens, because it sits on that corneal epithelium, just that mechanical friction does cause a little bit of cellular damage. That cellular damage can start kind of that inflammatory cascade. That inflammation then is going to damage some of those goblet cells. And so that's going to affect the tear film because it affects the mucin layer. And so when I have a contact lens patient, especially one that I know has dry eye, I'm really trying to kind of hone in and look to see if we have any mucin layer damage. And I'll show you how I do that a little bit later in this presentation. 
being mindful of ocular surgeries. So, you know, when we think about uh, eye surgery, LASIK is kind of the most common one that we think of, of causing dry eye. And LASIK certainly does increase that risk, but 77% of cataract uh, patients have dry eye. Penetrating keratoplasty is 60%. Glaucoma surgery, 78% of um, those patients tend to have dry eye afterwards. Blepharoplasty is a big one. And so it's helpful to you know, not forget that there are other ocular surgeries besides LASIK that can really contribute to um, ocular surface disease. Let's talk about lifestyle factors. So we know that we're on a screen more than ever. And we know that when we're on a screen, we tend to blink less. One study showed that when we're nice and relaxed, we tend to blink about 22 blinks per minute. When somebody's reading a book, that goes down. So it doesn't even have to be like a screen or a tablet or a phone. If they're just intensely focusing, doing homework or reading a book, that blink rate is already decreased. But then when we aren't, when they are on a screen and um, one study showed that if you're looking at text or video that's on a screen, that goes down even further to approximately seven blinks per minute, right? We know that that's not good. So we need to make sure that we're educating our patients on the lifestyle. And it's not just blinking when you're on a screen, you know, looking at the book, any sort of intense focusing up close could be contributing to, to dry eye. We also know that lifestyle, poor sleep sleep quality or just not enough sleep can definitely contribute to dry eye. And there's some studies that show that just psychological stress, right? We're all stressed that can contribute to dry eye. And so when you're doing a modern approach and you're taking a holistic component and you're looking at all these different factors, don't forget to address the lifestyle factors with your patients. If they're paying big bucks for these really awesome in-office treatments, you want to make sure you're covering these as well, or else you're not you're not going to see the um, improvement clinically or um, symptomatically as, as you'd hope. So let's move on a little bit to kind of the exam portion. And when we're doing a dry eye exam, um, you have to make sure that you're taking a step back and you're looking at the big picture, right? It's not just the corneas. It's not just the conjunctiva. You have to take a step back. And so just like we all learned in school, when you enter that exam room, turn the exam lights up and look at the patient, look at their skin, look at their face. Those can give some really good clues. And so I'm just going to dive into some of those just as kind of a refresher, because even though it sounds so simple, I get a lot of consultations in my dry eye clinic for stuff that's more big picture that's contributing to their dry eye. So I have a little eyelid exam checklist that I kind of go through in my head when I'm looking at a patient, whether it's a dry eye consult in our dry eye clinic or during you know, a primary eye care comprehensive eye exam, I'm looking at all these different factors. One thing I'm really watching, I'm making sure that you know, the lid architecture is there. Do they have an entropia? Do they have an extropia? Are there any telangiectasia on those, on those vessels? Uh, I'm looking at that lash line. Is there any biofilm that's there? I'm looking at their eyelashes. Do they look healthy? Does it look like they use an eyelash serum? Do they have eyelash extensions on? Are they missing eyelashes? Looking at the opening of the glands, pressing on the lids, what's coming out, what does it look like? Um, and then sometimes by, even by pulling down the lid, you can see the meibomian glands underneath it um, to some extent. What is that, you know, what clues do those um, show me? Blephritis is a big one. And so when I'm looking at that lid margin and when I'm developing kind of a treatment plan, you have to make sure you're addressing this. When I first started out, you know, before we had the dry clinic, before all this, I was really focused on improving the meibomian glands. And I missed a lot of eyelid stuff and I missed a lot of blephritis. And that led to patients getting better, but not getting the improvement that we needed to get them totally symptomatic free. And so if I had to give a piece of advice is that you can dive into all the fancy stuff, but make sure you don't miss blepharitis or that biofilm that's on the lid margin, because sometimes that alone can kind of make or break the success of a dry eye treatment. Just a reminder, blepharitis, we know that it's the inflammation of the eyelid margin. We get a, a buildup of that bacteria along that lid margin. That's going to release inflammation, which is going to, over time, cause um, some of those telangiectasia to increase. We can get that lid hyperkeratinization. We can get a folliculitis or even MGD. There's this biofilm analogy theory that's out there. And so hopefully a modern approach is also that you're not calling blepharitis eyelid dandruff. It's not dead skin cells. 
if you see blepharitis, it's, you know, be a better clinician and don't call it eyelid dandruff. It's a biofilm and a biofilm is just like plaque on your teeth. It's technically a layer of bacteria. It always tends to grow in an area that's warm and moist, has nothing to do with hygiene, but a lot of times the natural flora that's on the skin for some people will just overgrow in that area. And so it's a layer of bacteria. It has to be addressed or that bacteria can cause some issues. And sometimes it's almost hard to see. So when you're doing a slit lamp exam, like this picture here, if you were kind of blowing past this, you might think that it looks okay. But if you look closely, you'll see kind of this clear waxy layer. That's a very early form of blepharitis. And this is a stage that you want to treat it at. When you start getting to more advanced, like we're already kind of too far into that severe um, disease process. So do a really thorough exam. Look at that. When you start to see it, you won't miss it. But when you have that waxy stuff, treat that blepharitis, treat that eyelid um, margin here. The next kind of layer of that is that you'll start to see, it's still clear, but you'll start to see this tinting at the base of this lash or kind of this edema at that lash follicle. When you see that, definitely a sign that you have blepharitis. You definitely want to, to get on that so that the inflammation doesn't progress. And then when you start to get the little quote unquote crusties, right, of those little collarettes that are there, you definitely don't want to miss that. So collarettes, right? Is this blepharitis? Is this demodex? You know, is it a kind of a combination of the two? Well, one study showed that basically if you see collarettes, assume that it's demodex until proven otherwise. So anytime that's there, you know, in my, uh, in my clinic, I don't have the time to pluck a lash and look at it under the microscope. If I, if I see a collarette, I just assume it's demodex and, and we move on. Quick reminder of demodex, demodex are eye mites. So they um, are typically harmless, but when they have a higher density, which is usually around five mites per lash, then that can start to play a pathogenic role. It has a 14 day life cycle. They lay their eggs along those lash follicles and along those sebaceous glands. Their nourishment or their food comes from the epidermis and the sebum of the meibomian glands. They only have one opening. So they eat everything and then they practically implode. And that waste material of that can, on that lid epithelium can cause some inflammation. So when we see demodex, part of it is from that digest waste material and those little eggs that are hanging out. But the demodex inflammation can also come from just the mechanical damage that can sometimes happen because they have eight legs and they're scraping along that lash and lid margin. So, you know, that can contribute. And then their eye mites. So they also carry bacteria that can also contribute to inflammation. And so why, you know, Dimidex causes this kind of inflammation on the lid margin, there's kind of three different factors, but the biggest telltale usually with patients is itching. And there's kind of different types of itching. A lot of times if they say, you know, yeah, doc, I have some itching, I'll inquire a little bit further. This sort of itching is usually more allergy. And if they're like, oh, doc, I just got to get in there and get my little itch it and then I'm good. This sort of itching typically sometimes is, is a sign that kind of demodex is present. Be careful in how you word this. Some patients are going to be more sensitive to eye mites than others. I had one patient um, not too long ago that after we had this patient education conversation came back and she had shaved everything from head to toe. She felt like she could feel these eye mites crawling on her skin and it caused some psychological issues for her. And so you just need to be careful about your approach with that. And every patient's going to be different. You just have to be mindful of that. As far as a clinical pearl with cholerets or even blepharitis, you always have to have the patient look down. And so I love this example because at first glance, if you're just scrolling across kind of that top lid with your slit lamp, you might look at this lash line and be like, eh, it looks pretty good, nothing majorly going on. But if you have the patient look down, boom, collarettes are there. And that's a good indication that's, that's popping up. So a clinical pearl, especially if you want to build a dry eye or get better at dry eye, have the patient look down. It takes two seconds, and it gives you a lot of information about what's happening with that, um, that lid margin. Eyelash extension, you know, we all have a love-hate relationship with them. They look really awesome, but health-wise, they're not the best for, for, dry, um, for dry eye or just overall health in general. But we have to make sure we're educating our patients. So a lot of times when we see these extensions, you know, we've all seen the pictures, we've seen it clinically with our own eyes. There's a lot of buildup of just bacteria and demodex and just muck that's there. 
but we have to make sure we're telling the patients how to clean these and to be mindful of that. And so if you're not sure how to do that, you have to educate yourself first and in, uh, in order to kind of give um, the patient the best, the best advice. Our patients um, work hard for their money. And so sometimes lash extensions are, can be their pride and joy and their hard earned money on that. And so a lot of times they're so protective, they don't want to touch it too much or clean it too much because they don't want to damage them. So when I have my patients, um, we talk a lot about how different ways and different products to use in order to kind of keep this lash, um, this lash line and their extensions clean. Uh, just word of the wise with the glue that's on there. If you use any sort of cleanser that's kind of oil-based, that will strip the glue. So you just want to make sure that you're recommending a product that is great for hygiene, um, eyelid hygiene that doesn't have um, a lipid, an, an oily component to it. Looking at ocular rosacea in Maine, this is a very common condition that I have in that patients is, you know, and it's easily diagnosed by looking at the lid margin. So if you look at that lid margin and you see all those little telangiectasia vessels, even if they don't know that they have rosacea, ding, 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 ocular rosacea can be a big contributor to um, dry eye disease. Uh, sometimes it's really prominent, like this photo on the left, but sometimes on the right, it's pretty, it's pretty faint and you can almost miss it unless you're really kind of hyper-focusing in on it. With rosacea, there's four different types. Sometimes with, you know, regular rosacea, you can just be a little bit red. So as I'm teasing out some of these rosacea questions with my patients, I'll ask, like, do you ever get flushed after a workout? Do you ever get flushed after drinking like a glass of wine? If the answer is yes, I'm kind of thinking rosacea potentially. Sometimes rosacea can just look like little pustules. So oftentimes this can be misdiagnosed as acne in a patient won't realize that they have rosacea, they'll think that they just have acne. But if they have that, they could have an underlying ocular rosacea issue. Sometimes um, another type of rosacea is just getting that, um, you know, that enlarged nose. And so if, if that's there, if you see any of these rosacea signs, really look for ocular rosacea within the eye. Sometimes you can just have it in the eye. Sometimes you can just have it on the face. But more often than not with my patients, I see it having a little bit of both. And if you see this, this is contributing to dry eye. You have to make sure you're doing something to address it. Otherwise, you're not gonna see dramatic improvement with your um, dry eye patient. Rosacea just as a whole, currently it's really, we don't know a ton about it. We know that it's more common in the Northern European heritage. It affects males and females um, about the same, but we do know there's maybe possibly a little bit of correlation with Demodex, so much so that if you eradicate the Demodex, which can live not just on the eyelashes, but on you know, their facial skin, if you eradicate the Demodex, that does seem to alleviate some of those rosacea symptoms. So it's kind of a question of like a chicken or the egg, which came first? Did the Demodex come first or did the rosacea? We don't really know, um, but we still need to make sure we're addressing very underdiagnosed. And so, um, you know, you maybe wouldn't want to make the diagnosis of the facial, but if you see it on the eyes or if you see anything, you can encourage it to have that discussion with their PCP or their dermatologist. Common triggers, heat, cold, uh, UV radiation, alcohol, coffee, spicy food, um, you know, anything that kind of triggers inflammation. So sometimes that's a certain skincare ingredient. Sometimes that's a food ingredient. It varies per person. But if a patient's spending a lot of money and a lot of big bucks to get their dry eye better, you want to make sure that they're doing some lifestyle things at home that's going to best, um, best complement and minimize some of those rosacea triggers. My Bohmian glands, look at that lid margin. We know that they're on the top and bottom. Press on those lids and look at the sebum that's coming out. Just as a reminder, we want that sebum to be a very olive oil consistency. And we want just, it doesn't take much pressure, just a little bit. This is what you want to see. If you see anything that's thick, toothpastey, you know that you have inflammation there. If you see frothy tears, you know that that's a sign of inflammation. And so you wanna make sure you're getting rid of that inflammation if possible within those meibomian glands. We've all seen those kind of pimple popper-esque, but you'd be surprised sometimes it doesn't come out until you press on that um, eyelid um, margin surface. 
Another thing to be mindful of, again, as you're looking at the eyelid, is this lid wiper epitheliopathy. This is best seen with uh, lysamine, which is why whenever I'm doing kind of a dry patient, I love lysamine for this. You'll get kind of that, that staining and that lid wiper motion. And when you see that, that really just indicates that there's inadequate lubrication. And so that could be from a number of different factors, but that can contribute dry eye. And so when you see this here, there are certain dry eye treatments that aren't necessarily going to fix that if you don't have enough lubrication. So if you see this kind of staining pattern, you know, you need to be thinking artificial tear, possibly a lubricant, maybe a neurostimulator in order to kind of beef that up so that you don't get this lid wiper epitheliopathy. Conjunctival plays a big role. You know, we're, we're used to kind of looking at the staining of it, but if you have a lot of conjunctival chalasis, that's going to um, not get us totally symptomatically where we need to be. So just be mindful of that. If you put in lysamine and you see this staining here on the conjunctiva, most of the time be thinking about the mucin layer. So when I'm looking at that, if I see that I'm thinking ding, 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 mucin. And so I'm diving into that and thinking about how I can best improve the health of those goblet cells, but that's a big staining pattern not, not to miss. With the cornea, floor, uh, putting fluorescein in is really helpful. And when I look at the cornea, I look at a couple different things. I look at that tear meniscus. If that tear meniscus is healthy, I know we're making enough tears. Putting in stain, you know, looking at if there's staining patterns and where it's falling. So we know that if we see that staining pattern inferiorly, that probably means that their eyes are opening up a little bit. We wanna make sure we're taking care of that when they're sleeping at night. Looking at that tear breakup time, you know, you want it to be higher than 10 seconds, but documenting it, because as you're going through these dry patients, you want to have that quantitative data to look back at. Be careful of stain without pain. If you see a lot of stain there and the patient's asymptomatic, start thinking about something like neurotrophic keratitis. And so be, be super mindful. Um, with this, with the cornea, when you put in that stain, really be mindful too about sometimes with that fluorescein, there's a little bit of delayed uptake. So I've had to change my, my workflow a little bit. So my staff will put it in so that it's in for several minutes by the time that I see the patient. Because if you put it in too early and look, a lot of time that will not light up. Neurotrophic keratitis is one that's really underdiagnosed currently. And now we have some treatment options that are available. And so it should definitely be on your radar, but really for any dry eye patient, I always recommend, and what I always do is I always test corneal sensitivity, just like you put fluorescein and lysamine in as just kind of a very standard, definitely test corneal sensitivity because it could possibly be something that's a little bit different than dry eye. How do you test corneal sensitivity? Of course, you can use, you know, the official device, but in my clinics, a lot of times I'll just use like an unscented dental floss, or sometimes with your cotton tip applicators, you can take a little bit of that. And you want to make sure you're checking corneal sensitivity in every quadrant and then documenting it appropriately. When you're just getting started, you know, diagnostics, don't overlook fluorescein and don't overlook lysamine. They're your bread and butters. They're super cheap. They give you a lot of information. And so you should be doing this probably at any, at any workup, but even when you get really cool, awesome, fancy equipment, don't forget to go back to the basics because it tells you a lot of information that can be super helpful. Other diagnostics that can be helpful is looking at hyperosmolarity. So osmolarity, again, is just this, um, the measure of the salt concentration of the tears. And when that fluctuates, or if the tears are in, an, in a hyperosmal state, usually that can be indicative um, that we have some sort of inflammation there, and that can be indicative of possibly dry eye. Uh, tear lab, now um, under True Care Medical, is what has been kind of the, the key player um, historically. Now they have a new device called Scout Pro. If you're in Canada, you have iMed Pharma as a way to measure this um, hyperosmolarity. And as far as a number, you really kind of want 300-esque. Anything above 300, you're thinking, ah, something's throwing off this tear film and you need to um, change it a, a little bit differently. I treat uh, osmolarity just like I treat pressures when I have my glaucoma patients. For every dry eye follow-up, 
for their comprehensive full exam, I'm always checking osmolarity because I want to see if it's staying stable or if it's fluctuating a lot. And just like IOP, if I'm seeing a lot of fluctuations, that tells me that possibly our um, disease isn't being the best managed. Inflamadry is out there. It identifies the levels of MMP9. It's kind of like a pregnancy test. It either is positive or it's not, but it is 85% sensitivity. It is 94% specificity. And if you test it and it's positive, then you know that you have those MMP9 there. You know that you have inflammation. And that can be really helpful sometimes in those cases where you're like, is this allergy? Is this dry eye? You know, put that in there and that can kind of help guide you of where you need to be. Mybography is a really awesome tool to have. And if you're just getting started, I recommend doing this, um, getting some sort of device that does this for you because having these images is huge for patient education. And, um, and it's helpful too, because then, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but there's a MIBO scale that's out there. And if, if you don't already know it, get familiar with it, but it breaks down the different degree levels. And, and so you can assess and it has lower lid levels and it has upper lid levels. And when you have, um, when you're doing my biography, if you can look at both the lower lids and the upper lids, when we first rolled this out in our clinics, um, we screened everybody. So if anybody that came in for a comprehensive exam, we just automatically screened the lower lids. And if I saw any sort of thing kind of funky going on, I had my staff go back in and scan their upper lids. And that's really how we started kind of um, building this, this dry eye patient base. Be really careful though, is that um, if you see, you know, if you have um, a mybography image and you're looking at it and it doesn't look like there's any structural changes, that doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have anything going on with their meibomian glands. This could just mean that it's in a very early disease process. So if you see a picture like this, don't assume that everything's perfect and healthy. You have to press on the lid. You have to look at it a little bit more because sometimes this is the sweet spot to treat a patient if they have some stuff going on this is a sweet spot. If you wait until you have any sort of truncation or any sort of meibomian gland dropout, it just becomes a lot more complicated of a, of a disease process to treat. But if left untreated, then you, know, you can get severe truncation and dropout. And sometimes when they've already lost so much tissue, there's not a whole lot you can do to get that tissue back. Although possibly with IPL, we're seeing some improvement there, more to come with that research. As far as treatments for dry eye, you know, the goal with a modern approach is really to clean up that lid margin. If any demodex is there, get rid of it. You want to make sure that you're trying to decrease any sort of evaporative stress that could cause inflammation. So that's getting rid of any meibomian obstruction that's there, supplementing that aqueous or mucin layer if possible, and then overall just trying to decrease inflammation to the best that you can. So let's talk about some treatment options for each of those things. So if we look at that um, eyelid margin, you know, that biofilm that's there, approaches you could take. Currently on the market, there's Blefex, there's a Zest. Blefex is this top photo here. It uses a um, kind of like a toothbrush that has a sponge on it and it mechanically buzzes and buffs all of that plaque off. Zest um, made by Zocular, it uses an enzyme that's harvested from okra plants. It's kind of a gel, you put it on, it, it breaks down that plaque that's there, you rinse it off with saline um, that's here and it helps also get rid of that biofilm surface. Both of these, your technician can do if you feel comfortable with them and if they're well-trained, they can be a big practice um, builder. But if you're bare bones and balling on a budget, and, and I did this initially before we had a little bit of extra expense, you know, getting kind of the clear mascara wands and doing it as much in the office as you can is better than nothing. So you've got some options there. These usually don't come at a huge um a huge uh, expense to your office when you're just getting started. And this alone, cleaning up the eyelid margin makes a world of difference. Another treatment option on the market is BBL, broadband light or IPL intense pulse light. There's a lot of different factors, a lot of different companies that make kind of a version of IPL. 
but IPL is great for rosacea, blephritis, dimidex, if they have a sty um, or if they have any MGD, it can be a really awesome tool for that. IPL is essentially light. It's not a laser. It differs from laser because an IPL is non-monochromatic. It's non-coherent. It's defocused light and it plays with wavelengths. So in a dry eye world, typically we're going to work within a 590 um, wavelength. Anything aesthetically, if you were diving in that's deeper, is like if you were going to remove a hair follicle, that would fall deeper close to like a 615, 625. Something that's more superficial, like hyperpigmentation of the skin with light and an IPL usually falls within like a, a 515 kind of um, wavelength. But for dry eye, typically you'll see kind of in this 590 wavelength category. How um, IPL works is that light's emitted from that flash lamp, that light energy is absorbed um, by the oxyhemoglobin in the blood vessels. It gener generates heat and it coagulates those cells. So it really kind of halts that inflammatory process in a much earlier part of the cascade. IPL treats reds and browns, which is great for things like telangiectasia. Because it's also a heat, uh, it does kill any kind of surface bacteria that's there, which is very helpful for um, things like blephritis, right? And which is why we see some improvement with that inflammatory skin condition. And um, Dimidex has even been helpful. I'll put up a QR code in a little bit to where you can see IPL being used to kill Dimidex. With IPL, there's you want to use some sort of a, an eye shield protection. The left photo here shows sticky shields that you can use. Um, and with this, obviously you can't treat the lid, but if you use a laser grade medical shield, looks like nails in the eye, but it's very comfortable. It's just like a scleral lens, you pop them in, you're able to treat that eyelid margin um, a little bit closer and that's helpful. Because IPL dust targets reds and browns, you want to make sure you're avoiding any sort of hair follicle. So if you're treating near that lash line, you want to stay about two millimeters away. If you hit their lashes or if you hit their beard or their eyebrow accidentally, it could potentially um, make it so that they don't have that hair follicle growing back. Aesthetically, you'll see a lot of improvement with this, and it's helpful to kind of warn patients. Most of them are excited to have that. Um, but this is one of my patients after just one IPL, you can see how the skin texture changed. You can see how the redness improved. And so, you know, while that doesn't seem like a bad thing, it could be shocking to a patient. So you just want to make sure that you're educating on this, that this potentially could happen after something like IPL if you do it. This is the QR code if you want to watch the really dramatic video of IPL um, killing a Dimidex. With IPL, we do have one on the market now that's FDA regulated or FDA approved, um, not regulated. It came out in April 2021. It's Luminous's Optolite. This is cool because it's nice to be able to have something that's officially FDA approved for the treatment of meibomian gland dysfunction. The beauty of it is that it also has a pin, so it's a, it's a lot easier to kind of work along that eyelid margin. And this newer version that's FDA approved allows you to, ski, to treat up to a skin type five versus some other IPLs on the market are one through four. And so depending on your patient demographic, you just have to be pick which one's best for you. As far as opening up the oil glands, you know, trying to improve that MGD that's there, getting that backed up stuff out, there are um, a lot of different meibomian gland treatments. Lipoflow, tear care, Ilux, meibaflow, they all have pros and cons. And so you have to figure out what, which one best fits your practice and being able to incorporate that in. Radial frequency is another big one that's hitting the market. And this is great um, because it can also heat up those oil glands, but because it uses radio frequency and not just heat, a lot of times patients can see some improvement aesthetically underneath their eyes regarding bagginess, wrinkle reduction, and potentially even stimulating collagen. These treatments do last or take 30 to 60 minutes. And so again, deciding which is the best fit for your practice in your chair time and your office flow, you have to evaluate all the pros and cons. Neurostimulation is another category of dry eye. We're seeing a lot of progress here. If we can stimulate um, 
the trigeminal nerve to aggravate the lacrimal gland, we can see some improvement in aqueous that's being made. The cool thing about neurostimulation is that can also uh, stimulate, when you hit the trigeminal nerve, you can also stimulate the meibomia glands and the goblet cells so that you can produce a more stable basal tear, which is why we see kind of new players in the field, um, like, uh, Varenicline, which is a new nasal spray that's on the market to help with dry eye. And then there's eye tear, which is a, a device that you press on the outside that can again stimulate um, that trigeminal nerve pathway. Other therapeutics, just as we wrap up, that can be very great for a modern approach to dry eye, serum tears, amniotic membranes, of course, steroids play a big role at decreasing inflammation, regenerize um, the amniotic membrane drops that are currently on the market, cyclosporin, lefitograss, all of those plays a huge role. And a lot of times you have to use these complementary with your in-office treatments in order to get um, the best results that you want. Maintenance, you know, we all know hot compresses. We all know not to recommend a uh, baby shampoo. Give your patient specific recommendations for eyelid cleansers. If you skimp on this, they're gonna buy the cheapest thing that's on the shelf. So taking the time, whether you sell them in the office or you have the patient education sheets that shows them what they need um, to buy. Omega-3s, we can talk a little bit more about that if you have questions offline. One quick thing with kids is that if you have a kid that's having a lot of chalasia, a lot of cordiolans that pops up, be mindful that there's not an underlying vitamin A deficiency. Quick little blood test can show for that. And cool things coming down in the dry eye world, we see, um, you know, Tarsus is going to have a drug specifically to target uh, Dimidex later in the year. And Dompe has a really cool thing coming out for Sjogren's patients. And then a whole separate level, you know, a whole separate lecture when you're doing this is being mindful of that cosmetic impact. There's a lot of different makeup and skincare ingredients that can affect dry eye. And so when you're talking about these with patients, taking a step back and being very inclusive and, and helping them guide them through the process.